Well, it's a very great pleasure to be with you this evening. Please turn in your Bibles to the second letter of Paul to Timothy and to chapter 3. We'll break into the reading at verse 10 and we'll read to the end of the chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 10. Paul has been writing about ungodly men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And we give thanks to God for his word, and we look to him for his help and blessing as we ponder a little part of that. We begin by picturing to ourselves a little boy. It's the Jewish Sabbath. He is being taken by his mother to the local synagogue. And there he hears the scriptures being read, scriptures of the Old Testament. And doubtless at home he hears them again from his mother's lips. The commandments of scripture, the stories of scripture, the songs of scripture, the prophecies of scripture from his childhood. This young boy is becoming familiar with Holy Scripture. Well, there are no prizes for guessing who this young boy is. Paul says to Timothy, verses 14 and 15, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings Holy Scriptures. From his earliest years, Timothy was becoming familiar with the Bible. And perhaps for the majority of you who are here this weekend, it is exactly the same. The Bible is a book with which you have been familiar from childhood as I have been. Now for us, of course, it's a much bigger book. Timothy's Bible was the 39 books of the Old Testament. Our Bible has grown to 66 books. And it is about this now much bigger book, the Bible as a whole, that I want to speak to you in these two sessions. What can we say about the Bible? And in particular, in the light of Paul's words here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, well, we can say two things. There are two things that I want you very much to see. The first is what an extraordinary book the Bible is, and that's going to be our theme for this evening's session. And the second thing that I want you to see is what an extraordinary blessing the Bible is, and that will be our theme for Sunday morning. Well, this evening... What an extraordinary book the Bible is. In the British Library, there are somewhere in the region of 14 million books. 
in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., some of the region of 16 million books. And some of those books are very ancient indeed. Among all those millions and millions of books, there is no book like the Bible. It is in a class of its own. It is absolutely unique. You have in your hands, you have on your phones, an extraordinary book. Well, let's glance at the evidence. It lies, first of all, in what is said here about the Bible. And what is said here about the Bible is that it is breathed out by God. Verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by by God. Now, in some English versions, the word inspiration is used. If you have a New King James Version in front of you, for example, our text reads, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed or breathed out by God is simply a more literal translation of the original Greek. And here's what that's saying. It is saying that it has come from God. God is its origin or its source. It's from his mouth. He breathed it out. One writer puts it like this. What we have in the Bible is the heart of God in the words of God. It is from him. Now, that does not in any way negate or play down the Bible's human authorship. The Bible came from the pens of men, and many of their names are very familiar to us. Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the other Old Testament prophets, writing prophets. You come into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul, John, and Peter. We have the Bible that we have because these men took up their pens and wrote and what is more, what they wrote is stamped with their personalities. They all had their own individual style. And their contributions are shot through with their own experiences. No one but David could have written the Psalms of David. No one but Paul could have written Paul's letters. So much of their personal history is woven into the fabric of the texts that they have written for us. For all these reasons and more, the Bible is an intensely human book and we must never play that down. And yet, at one and the same time, breathed out by God. Now, there's a great deal of mystery in that, a point beyond which we cannot go. So we try to fathom that, how a book can be so wonderfully human and yet so altogether of God. We mustn't think, for example, as we do try to figure this out, we mustn't think that it's a matter of proportions. The Banner of Truth has published some of the works of a Scottish theologian by the name of William Cunningham. Cunningham's biography, not published by the banner, but Cunningham's biography was started by one writer and finished by another. That is not how it is with the Bible. God doing one bit and the human writers doing the rest. Someone has put it like this. God was 100% engaged in breathing out his word the human authors were 100% active in writing out that word. And God himself hasn't explained that. But it's a fact. Men are not the final explanation for this amazing book. Or to put it in another way, this isn't a book to which God has simply contributed something giving it certain qualities like accuracy or, or sublimity or whatever. He himself, 
through the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit in the human authors, breathed it out. So much so that it is nothing less than his word to us. So as we think about what an extraordinary book the Bible is, here is our first line of evidence. What is said about it, it was breathed out by God. And our second line of evidence is this. What is said here about the Bible is said about the whole Bible. All scripture is breathed out by God. It is not the case that only some of the Bible is breathed out by God. It has all been breathed out by God. It is all his word. Now, in the first instance, that means the whole of the Old Testament is breathed out by God. We go back to verse 15 and how from his childhood Timothy had been familiar with the sacred writings or holy scriptures. Which writings? The writings of the Old Testament. When Timothy was growing up, there was no New Testament in existence. It had still to be written. The Bible then was made up of exclusively of the 39 books of the Old Testament. That was Jesus' Bible, that was Paul's Bible, that was Timothy's Bible. But that's not the end of the matter. By the time Paul wrote this letter, the second letter to Timothy, this is right at the end of Paul's life, this is the last letter that we have from his pen, the scriptures were beginning to grow. New books were being added, and Paul himself was a major contributor. I think of something that the Apostle Peter says in his second letter. He's talking about Paul's letters. This is also a very comforting thing for those of us who struggle with Paul's letters. He says there are some things in them that are hard to understand. If you struggle to understand Paul's letters... Paul's fellow apostle struggled too. There are some things in them which are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Paul's letters had come to be recognised as being on a par with the other scriptures, the scriptures of the Old Testament. They, too, were being breathed out by God. They, too, were God's own words. It's part of what God had in mind in calling men and equipping them to be apostles of Jesus Christ, that they might afterwards become penmen of Holy Scripture. So in Paul's day, Scripture is growing. New books are being added, and on and on it goes until at last we have what we have today. The 39 books of the Old Testament plus the 27 books of the New Testament. Now, we don't have all the details of how the early church came to recognise these books as God breathed. But that's what they did. It was a time of fresh revelation. For 400 years, no addition had been made to the Bible. And then with the coming of the Lord Jesus... And the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, God began breathing out new scripture. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that was recognized by the early church. And they took these books and they placed them on a par with the Old Testament scriptures. And so it continued until we have the Bible that we have today. Back to 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. As Paul writes these words about all scripture being breathed out by God, he's thinking primarily about the Old Testament. But they don't just apply to the Old Testament. They apply to more than the Old Testament. They apply to the New Testament scriptures as well. They apply to all the scriptures. All 66 books from Genesis. Revelation. 
So there's the second line of evidence as we think about what an extraordinary book the Bible is. What is said about the Bible is said about the whole Bible, all Scripture. It is all God-breathed. And so we don't pick and choose. We don't say, well, I think this bit was God-breathed. I can admit that, but no, that bit wasn't God-breathed. We say that the whole of the Bible is breathed out by God. It is from God in its entirety. And that includes those parts of the Bible where ungodly men are speaking. The Old Testament, for example, records the arrogant words of Pharaoh. Do you remember his response to Moses and Aaron when they came saying that he was to let the people go? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I don't know the Lord, and nor am I going to obey his voice. Arrogant words. And then there's the blasphemies of the Assyrian officer who railed against God in the days of Isaiah the prophet. The Old Testament records those words. Similarly, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we have the record of the cruel mockery of those who mocked our Saviour when he was on the cross. And in the book of Acts, we have a less than truthful letter from a Roman officer who arrested Paul the Apostle. Now, we do not say for one moment that these men were moved by the Holy Spirit to say and to write the ungodly things that they did. But we do say that the writers of Scripture were moved by God to record their words for our instruction. God wanted us to hear the arrogant words of Pharaoh. And he wanted us to hear the blasphemies of the Rabshakeh, the Assyrian officer. And so he moved the authors of Scripture to put those words down. For our instruction, or think about the book of Job. This is a very interesting example. God charges Job's three friends with saying things about God that were not true. You have not spoken of me what is right. These men were not moved by the Spirit to say the things to Job that they said to him. But the writer of Job was moved by the Holy Spirit to make a record of them for our instruction. God wanted us to hear the speeches of these three friends and indeed Job's own words, which were not always great. And so the Spirit moves someone. We don't know who he was to put all of that down for our instruction. So it's all God breathed. The whole Bible It's all his word to us. Now that being so, there are two things that follow. Two necessary implications of what we have just been seeing. Number one, the Bible is totally trustworthy. If in its entirety it has come from the mouth of God, then it follows necessarily that it is totally trustworthy. You will hear people speaking about the inerrancy of Scripture, or you may hear them speaking about the infallibility of Scripture. To all intents and purposes, these two words, inerrant and infallible, are the same they mean that the Bible is totally trustworthy. Here's a quotation from the English theologian J.I. Packer. Infallible, he says, denotes the quality of never deceiving or misleading, and so means holy, trustworthy, and reliable. 
Inerrant means wholly true. Scripture, he says, is termed infallible and inerrant to express the conviction that all its teaching is the utterance of God who cannot lie, whose word, once spoken, abides forever, and that it may be trusted implicitly. You think about all that the Bible teaches us about God, about humankind, about sin, about creation, about the past, the present, and the future, about heaven and hell, about Christ and the way of salvation through faith in him. It is all true. The authors of the books from which we get these things were no mere men of their time, simply reflecting the primitive worldviews of their day. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit in what they wrote. It's the very language that Peter uses in his second letter. And the result is a book that for all its humanity is a true and trustworthy revelation of the mind of God. And don't let anyone say to you that that can't be so. Because the authors were themselves fallible men, well, necessarily their contributions were fallible. That is not the case. I think of that great question that was put to Abraham by the Lord, is anything too hard for the Lord? That applies to the writing of Holy Scripture. God was able to so prepare these men as they thought about what they were going to write and so teach them and so help and guide them and what it was that they eventually put down on paper that the Bible that came from their pens is totally trustworthy. So that's one implication. This extraordinary book that in its entirety is God-breathed. It's totally trustworthy. And secondly, second implication, it is to be believed and obeyed. If it is all God-breathed, and therefore totally trustworthy, then we are to believe it and obey it. I wonder how many of you are familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It is a marvellously succinct answer to its second question, what do the Scriptures principally teach? The Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and the duty God requires of man. It's a book of faith and duty. What is to be believed and what is to be obeyed and its contents covering the whole of life. Now, how are we to respond to all of that? In the light of the doctrine of our text, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's all his word. The word of the God who made us. The God who has supreme and unchallengeable authority over us. Our duty, accordingly, is to recognise that authority and submit to it. By believing what the scriptures teach us to believe and by doing what the scriptures instruct us to do. So we're thinking about this extraordinary book. This book that in its entirety is breathed out by God. And we've been thinking about the implications of that. It is totally trustworthy. And it is to be believed and obeyed. In the time that remains, let me touch on two big questions. We've had two main headings, two implications, and now two big questions. Here's the first. 
How important is this doctrine that all Scripture is breathed out by God? How important is that? The answer is it is all important. It is the foundation of everything else. Think about it. What we have in these words of the Apostle Paul here is Scripture's self-witness, or to put it in another way, Scripture's doctrine of Scripture. Put the question to your Bible. What kind of book are you? The book says to you in response, I am from God. And it doesn't just say that because of 2 Timothy 3, in all kinds of ways, all the way through. That's what it's saying to you. I am from God. Now let's suppose that the Bible is wrong. Or let's suppose that its writers got that wrong. Men like Paul writing this second letter to Timothy. What if in fact the Bible is only partially God-breathed? Or let us suppose that in its entirety it is man-breathed. What then? Well, if we can't accept its self-witness as true, if it's wrong in the claims that it makes about itself, what grounds do we have for being sure that it's right in all the other things that it teaches us? And in all the demands that it makes of us. Take for one example, because it's very, very important that we that we see this. Just take take for one example. Here's what lies at the heart of our Christianity: the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Where do we get all that? We get it from the Bible. It's the Bible that tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's the Bible that tells us that the eternal word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's the Bible that assures us that if we call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. You see the problem? If the Bible is not to be relied upon when it tells us the kind of book that it is, if it isn't a God-breathed book, the God-breathed book that it claims to be, and therefore totally trustworthy, and authoritative for faith and practice, we're in trouble. Because it means that we can't be sure that we've got the gospel right. Did God so love the world that he gave his one and only son? Is that the explanation for Jesus? And is the alternative really so stark Believe or perish? Or is the way of salvation really so simple? Call upon the name of the Lord. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as for Jesus himself, is he really the eternal word who became flesh? You see, if this book is not God-breathed in its entirety, we have no assurance that any article of the Christian faith is true. And then there are all the commandments, the biblical standards for life in this world. All the controversial stands that the Bible takes on the sanctity of life, on marriage, on sexual morality. If this book is not God-breathed, What grounds do we have for believing that we ought to obey these things and tell our society that they need to do the same? 
on pain of God's judgment. It is no exaggeration to say that this doctrine that all Scripture is God breathed is all important. It is absolutely foundational. You take this away and we have no certainty with regard to any doctrine or any practice. We're just struggling after the light. We're just trying to chart our own course and it would be arrogant in the extreme to say, well, you ought to believe this and you ought to do that. It's the foundation. Which brings us to our second big question. How then do we know that this doctrine is true? That the Bible's witness to itself is correct? That scripture in its entirety really is God-breathed with all the implications of that for faith and life? Well, that is a question that our Puritan forefathers addressed way back in the 1600s when they gathered in London for the famous Westminster Assembly. And here's how they answered it. This is from chapter 1 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, section 5. They begin with a list of things that as they put it, abundantly evidence the Bible to be the word of God. Now, the language is old, but it's clear. Here's their list of things that abundantly evidence the Bible to be the word of God. The heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of men's salvation, the many other incomparable excellences and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. In other words, Scripture is like creation. Creation bears the marks of its divine origin. God has left his fingerprints on the creation. Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim his handiwork. Paul in Romans 1, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Creation bears witness to its divine creator. And so to the scriptures, they bear the mark of their divine origin. And in that sense, they are self-authenticating. They abound in internal evidence that they are exactly what they say they are. But the Puritans didn't stop there. They recognised that the internal witness, the internal witness of the Bible to itself, was not sufficient in and of itself. Something else was needed to persuade us. And that is what they call the witness of the Holy Spirit. And here's how they conclude the section from which I've just been quoting. They listed all these things that abundantly evidence the Bible to be the word of God. And then they add these all-important words. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. The inward work of the Holy Spirit. The statement that we've been looking at this evening from 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is God-breathed, it's not capable of the kind of proof with which you would verify 
some historical or, or scientific or mathematical fact. But that doesn't make the belief that it's true a leap in the dark. Far from it. There are all these things throughout the Bible that abundantly evidence it to be the word of God. And above all, the witness of the Holy Spirit. It is ultimately he who persuades us that the Bible is the word of God. It is he who persuades unbelievers and then deepens that persuasion as we become believers. And as we close, just think, if you will, how much of this ministry of the Holy Spirit you have personally known yourselves. This isn't something remote from us. Here you are, and you are Christians. Why are you Christians? Why are you trusting in Jesus Christ, God's Son, to be your Saviour? Because the Spirit has taken the teachings of the Bible on God and sin and salvation and has enabled you <coughs> to believe them. Or think about the way that you're living. Most of you, perhaps all of you, are seeking to please God. To live in obedience to God. Why is that? Given how hostile our society is to the standards of the word of God, it is because the Spirit of God has taken the commandments of God and has persuaded you that this is how God would have you live. in regard to all the various areas of Christian conduct. Or think about your relationship to the Bible. You read it. You want to hear it taught. You are eager to grow in your understanding of it and you want it to have a, a deeper and deeper impact on your life. That's why you're here at this Banner Youth Conference this weekend. Why this relationship to the Bible when so many of your contemporaries couldn't care tuppence about the Bible? They wouldn't even dream of opening it. It's the reality and power of the witness of the Holy Spirit persuading you that this is the word of God. This is solid gold. This is treasure. And you want to unearth more of it. You want to your soul strengthened by it. Do you know what this witness of the Spirit is all about? From rich personal experience, just as I do. And that being so, we know what to pray for then when we pray for unbelievers, your fellow students, young people who are to whom you're reaching out with the gospel. Pray, pray. Pray for the witness of the Holy Spirit to persuade them that this book really is extraordinary and has come from God. And it's what to pray for as we pray for ourselves, as you pray for yourselves. Because until we are in glory, until we're out of this world with its sin and fallenness, until we are free from the assaults of the evil one, our faith in the word of God is going to come under attack. Maybe through things you read in the Old Testament, things that you don't understand, the objections of this clever skeptic or that. You know what it is to have your faith assaulted. I certainly do, still do. The witness of the Spirit. Lord, deepen, deepen my persuasion that this really is your word from one end to the other. God will hear that prayer. And as you read and as you study and as you walk with God, 
He will sustain your faith and by his blessing that conviction will deepen with all the fruits of that in the Christian lives that you then lead. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this extraordinary book. How blessed we are to have it in our own language, to have it in our hands, to have it in our phones, to have it in our homes, and to have it in our minds and hearts. We think of Timothy becoming acquainted with the sacred writing since he was a child. Lord, many of us here in this room give you thanks because that has been our experience. We've known about this book. We've known something of its contents from our earliest days. Others perhaps just beginning to make the great discoveries. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen our faith in the truth of the things of which we have been thinking this evening. We pray that you will show us those things in the word of God that abundantly evidence it to have come from your hand. Show us the marks of your authorship. And may we know an ever richer, ever deeper, ever fuller ministry of the Holy Spirit bearing witness with the word to our hearts, deepening our persuasion, cry to you for friends and fellow students and colleagues and family members who do not believe. And we ask, Lord, that that is what they would know. We pray that in our churches there would be a reformation, that the Bible would have its rightful place and would be accepted and lived in accordance with its truth. Hear us, we pray. We thank you for this session together. We thank you for this conference. We pray, Lord God, that you will be with us throughout this weekend together, that it may be rich in communion with you and in fellowship with one another. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.